going to be talking about Rebel's Guide to Walter Rodney. Um, so super excited. The goal for today, um, channel speak for about 20 to 30 minutes, um, and then we'll open up dialogue and discussion and debate for 45 minutes. And then um, Chin, if you'd like, you can kind of wrap everything up together with five minutes at the end. Um, and also, if it's okay with everybody, we're going to be recording it, but we'll just be recording um, the folks who are speaking um, with the goal of potentially using it to transcribe um, or to, for internal purposes. So just wanted to let everybody know. Um, so before we get started, um, just want to say that um, we want this to be as respectful as possible um, and debate is beautiful and should be healthy. So when we do do discussion, um, just be mindful of that and we're going to prioritize the safety of everybody. So, um, so yeah, so let's get started. Chen, I'll give it to you and you'll have 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wrote this book, Comrades, because I think the Afro-Guyanese historian, Walter Rodney, is one of the most brilliant revolutionaries of the last century. But he's also one of the most underrated and understudied, especially if you compare him to the likes of, I don't know, Malcolm X, uh, Angela Davis, or Franz Fanon. And in terms of Rodney's political identity, um, there's many labels that have been given to Walter Rodney at various periods of time. I mean, some people have called him a Pan-Africanist. Some people call Walter Rodney a guerrilla intellectual. Um, some of his closest friends and supporters call themselves Rodneyites. And of course, there's some truth here to all of these definitions. But what I wanted to emphasize in my book is that Walter Rodney was above all else a Marxism, somebody who fought for the self-emancipation of ordinary working people and for the liberation of the oppressed. Somebody who saw Marxism not just as a tool, but as a revolutionary theory and a guide to action. And so my book is in many crucial ways, the story about how Rodney engaged with Marxism through his various journeys in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Uh, and I believe in recent years that there's been a renewed interest in Rodney's um, ideas and his story. And I think this is partly due to the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement and countless movements to uh, decolonize education in recent years. Because what we've seen here is hundreds of thousands of young, you know, black and white people challenging state racism, challenging police brutality. But in that process, they're also questioning history, you know, by pulling down the statues of racist slave owners in Bristol. And during these times, you know, in 2020 especially, um, there was a real desire to uncover the voices of marginalized people who spoke against imperialism, who spoke against the legacy of empire. And Rodney is increasingly uh, becoming one of those go-to people again, especially through his book, you know, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, which I will uh, talk about later on. Um, I think the other aim of my book was more straightforward. It's to get young, especially Black people, acquainted with Rodney's uh, life and work, and also, you know, to put Rodney's life and work in context, because it might seem quite distant um, to us here in 2022. Uh, so I think the first thing uh, to say about Rodney's early years is that, you know, there's a real actuality uh, of the annual struggle, uh, and there's a real much to, to independence going on across the, uh, across the globe. So Rodney is born in 1942 and grows up in British Guyana in the 1950s, which is, of course, a British colony in Latin America, but culturally, you know, it's closer to like the, the, the Caribbean. And Rodney's parents are supporters of this anti-colonial party, which is really the only game in town called uh, the People's Progressive Party, which calls itself Marxists uh, at the time, but it's in between reformism and, and Stalinists. But, you know, nevertheless, that party will have, you know, a long uh, lasting influence on how Walter Rodney, like, you know, approaches Marxism. He would say that he never had any initial animosity towards Marxism because, you know, that party called itself Marxist and was leading the struggle against the British. And also when Walter Rodney grows up here in 1953, you know, it's a rare moment in Guyanese politics because you have the two major groups, um, the Africans, who come from slavery and the indo guyanese who come from indentureship, well, they un they're united in this anti-colonial struggle. And this is a rare moment because usually the two groups are kept apart, have been kept apart in Guyanese modern history by uh, the planters and the colonial authorities. 
And to fast forward here, Rodney has brilliant grades. You know, he, ends a he earns a scholarship to go to university in Jamaica, where he studies at the University of West Indies. And this is in the run-up to Jamaican independence. So you see Rodney here, you know, rediscovering you know, African history, that part of history that has been wiped out through colonialism. You see Rodney also becoming fascinated with the Cuban revolution, traveling, traveling to, to Cuba. And Rodney eventually goes to, 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 to London where he joins a, a Marxist study group um, where he, well, he gets his PhD in African history. But at that time, he also joins a Marxist study group which is taught by CLR James and his wife Selma where he reads the classic of Marxist literature, um, where he reads passages of Capital or the 18th Brumaire of, Blue, uh, of Napoleon Bonaparte. But Rodney is also fascinated by the various uh, guerrilla struggles that are going on in you know, the Portuguese colonies in Africa. He's, he's very much um, a fan of Che Guevara and he reads Frantz Fanon as well. So you have there, you know, in a nutshell, the formation if you like, of an African historian who's very much interested in Marxism, but it's really from the year 1968 to 1980, where Rodney's life gets really interesting, where he emerges as a key theoretician and a key, if you want, um, um, activist, becoming increasingly more, you know, a, a, a convinced, determined Marxist. And I want to talk to you here through some of the major themes um, in, in Rodney's life. And, the first thing I think is that Rodney's life says a lot about the role of radical inter intellectuals, especially radical intellectuals operating in the global South. You know, it raises the question very much of what does it mean to be a radical intellectual? Is it simply to write a spicy article against capitalism in a language that nobody understands and to go home, eat dinner and forget about the class struggle? Or is there more to it than that? And I think in Rodney's life, there's a, always a real attempt to link his radical ideas against imperialism to the practical activity of the masses, uh, link his radical ideas to the ordinary men and women who are making history. And one powerful example of that is Rodney's activism in Jamaica during the year 1968. You know, 1968 is a year of global, of global revolt, as you know. But in, in that year, Rodney is 26 and he's teaching at the University of Kingston. Um, and he shows very quickly that he's very different from most middle class, you know, educated academics on campus, in the sense that Rodney decides not to stay in his ivory tower, he lives off campus, and you can find him in the ghettos of Kingston, you know, um, talking to, to Rastafarians, giving a speech to unemployed youth, you know, really relating to the people around him and doing a lot of listening as well. And it's through Rodney's speeches on Jamaican politics and African history, and through his overall interactions with the masses in Jamaica that he develops this version of black power, which is adapted to the Jamaican context and the Caribbean. You know, um, well, obviously black power is, is a US born phenomenon first, uh, but in America, you know, black power is very much the slogan of the black minority. Uh, the black minority that faces housing and jobs discrimination at the hands of white police officers uh, or white real estate agents. You know, Stokely Carmichael during those years at the time was the key architect of black power, was mainly asking for blacks, you know, to fight for the control of the, econ of the economics and the politics of their community, not the nation, but their community. When you're talking about the Caribbean context, however, you know, you're talking about a whole different ball game because the majority of the people are black. You know, the president in many countries is black or at least like non-white. And the problem here is that this, this Car local Caribbean elite of the independence is colluding um, with the Western companies. You know, in Jamaica, the mines were controlled by, by the Canadians, the cigarette states by the British. Um, and, and, you know, this elite in collusion with the Western companies also keep the masses in terrible conditions as an in independence. And so, you know, Rodney's formulation of black power um, at the time takes more of a radical ambitious tone, one that plays attention to the classes 
in, in the Caribbean and, and in Jamaican society, where he's really calling for the Black oppressed, you know, to break with imperialism and their local allies, for the Black oppressed masses to control the economics and the politics of the whole, of the whole island and to remake the whole islands of the Caribbean in their own image, a really, a really like powerful message. And for Rodney, you know, in his in his speeches and writing in Black Power, what comes out of them is also a very political definition of blackness. Where for Rodney, you're not black because you're simply of African descent or have some mystical like uh, tie to Africa. You're you're black if you're a victim of racism and imperialism. And what Rodney was trying to do in his speeches is really tie the destinies of the black masses. Um, in Jamaica with all the people in the third world who were fighting against imperialism and racism and for independence at the time. And eventually Rodney sees, um, eventually the Jamaican government seizes upon Rodney's activity in Jamaica and ends up banning Rodney. And when news spread that Rodney is banned, you know, you have a protest by, by students, which is joined by Rastafarians and unemployed youths. And it turns into a like, a rebellion which becomes known as the Rodney riots. But unfortunately, these riots, you know, uh, mark the end of Rodney's activities in Jamaica because they don't manage to bring them back. Uh, let me jump to another important lesson, I think, in Rodney's life, because I think Rodney's life is very much one where he comes to recognize, if you like, the difference between socialism from above and socialism from above, uh, from below. And I think this transformation is very evident uh, when Rodney becomes a history professor in Tanzania from 1969 to 1974. You know, Tanzania at the time is the absolute mecca of African liberation. You know, it's the, it's the kind of place where you can wine and dine with freedom fighters from, from Mozambique and listen to a conference by uh, CLR James or Chedi Jagan in the same evening. And you know, and this is because of that man who you see on my slide here, who's smiling in the area, the president of Tanzania, who like opposed imperialism more than um, most African leaders at the time, who really like, um, you know, um, hosted a series of national liberation movements in Southern Africa. But when I was writing about Rodney's time in Tanzania, you see, I had in mind the hangover from um, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, defeat in Britain. You know, Jeremy Corbyn, who was a radical leader of the Labour Party, who popularized the word socialism in Britain. But when you come to think of it, Jeremy Corbyn's plan for delivering socialism was basically elect me to parliament and I would give socialism to you, uh, the, part, the passive masses. And you see Rodney, when he was in Tanzania, he had to deal with a different kind of socialism from above. One that was very different from Jeremy Corbyn's socialism, one that I would call state capitalist. But in that sense, Nyerere's socialism resembled Jeremy's socialism in its refusal to see um, the workers, you know, the ordinary working people as capable of carrying out their own liberation. And when we talk about Tanzanian socialism, what Nyerere was trying to do through the state was to make the peasants work harder by putting them into collective farms to achieve, you know, self-reliance in food in many respects that never worked, but also to, um, to, to increase production mainly so that Tanzania can become a competitor on the international market. Uh, the Tanzanian regime also nationalized a lot of the factories and, and the banks. Um, but it was really the socialism of the petty bourgeoisie, you know, the small minority that was educated uh, under colonialism and that gained state power from their colonial masters. And, and this small minority, instead of sharing power with the masses, what it did is that it put the whole nation to work harder, it put the workers and the peasants to work harder to, to make up for centuries of underdevelopment. And Rodney, at first, he supports, you know, uh, this Tanzanian socialism called Ujama, and he sees it as a radical attempt to, um, to eradicate poverty in, in the countryside. But he realizes pretty, um, 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 he realizes at some point in time that, you know, the, um, the, the, whole, the whole process of collectivization generates terrible results. You know, the peasants are, are forced against their will into these collective farms. When they're in these collective farms, they have no control whatsoever over the process of production. And Rodney starts to document the resistance of, of peasants. Uh, more importantly, Rodney pays attention to the revolts, you know, uh, in the nationalized factories again in Tanzania against the, the Tanzanian bureaucracy. 
And Rodney ends up, you know, supporting these like spontaneous wildcat strikes and occupations uh, that go against the management in Tanzania. And he realizes that these strikes led by the Tanzanian workers, you know, are going beyond simple bread and butter issues, but they're really raising the, the wider question of who is the boss in the so-called socialist society, you know, who should control production in the so-called socialist society, you know, and he um and he's really coming back to the core of Marx's teaching here that the self-emancipation of the working class must be the act of the working class itself. He's really acknowledging that the workers can run the factories better than the management and that they hold the keys to running a new democratic society from below. Um, Tanzania at the time is also when Rodney writes his most famous book, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, which is also called um, the Yitta Little Yellow Book, as you can see here. Uh, uh, which is arguably um, Rodney's masterpiece. And what Rodney here asked from Tanzania, you know, it's um, in the decade after independence, you know, why haven't most African countries broken ties with the former colonial powers uh, uh, and, and still remain poor and largely underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped? You know, he's asking wider questions, like why is Africa underdeveloped? It's simply because of, um, is it simply the fault of Africans because of corruption or are there much larger historical forces at play here? And how, how Europe underdeveloped Africa really tells the story of how the European bourgeoisie through the slave trade and colonialism robbed Africa of its natural resources and labor. Um, and while that robbery impoverished Africa, it contributed to the development of capitalism in Europe, you know, through the industrial revolution uh, and so on. And I wanna say an anecdote here on the significance of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, because when I was like 19, 20, I attended a, a Pan-African study group. Uh, and the people who were um, teaching that Pan-African study group were absolutely haunted by a phrase that, uh, a sentence that the, the a speech that the French president Sarkozy had, had made in 2007, where, where Sarkozy, the French president, the problem with art has not entered history, but Africa has no history. And I think the opening chapters of Rodney's book were a real antidote to that statement because he uses historical materialism to reconstruct African pre-colonial society in all its dynamism and complexity, showing that you know Africa in the 16th century before colonialism was somewhere between um, a lot of like had loads of communalist societies with equal access to land, uh, quite equal societies. But also you had a handful of feudal societies like Ethiopia or, or the Congo, which achieved great things. But also he kept on telling the lives of ordinary African people and their contributions, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. And what I like about Rodney's book also is that in the final chapter, he spends a lot of time destroying the racist um, um, idea that colonialism did some good things for Africans. You know, when I was growing up at school, my teachers used to tell me that colonialism, uh, you know, colonialism did some good for Africans because uh, the colonizers bought railways and, and healthcare. And, you know, Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, really gave me all the counter arguments that I needed. You know, uh, Rodney in the book says, hey, the railways, they weren't built so Africans could visit their friends. You know, all the, the major trend lines went from the interior um, to the ports in order to ship raw materials to Europe. And on the question of healthcare, you know, Rodney uses like the, um, the example of uh, the Portuguese empire where the Portuguese spent 500 years in Africa, but in those 500 years, they weren't able to train one single doctor in Mozambique. And that is the true reality of what colonialism was. And what Rodney is trying to do in his book He's trying to, to tell Africans, you know, really that, that in the decade after colonialism, that if you want real development, a society that can eradicate poverty, where everybody is free to use their abilities to, to, to live the life that they want to live, well, you need to break with capitalism because capitalism is the principal agent of centuries of African underdevelopment. Now, let me say um, a word on Rodney's understanding of racism and how to fight it, because you see in 1974, 
Rodney leaves Tanzania and he returns to Guyana uh, to fight the dictatorship of the man who you see on the left here, the uh, uh, Forbes Burnham, um, who's the black guy in the image. Uh, and that dictatorship calls itself socialist, a bit like Nyerere in Tanzania, uh, but it really isn't. It's uh, state capitalist in even more cynical ways than, uh, than Nyerere. Uh, you know, the state in Guyana had controlled 80% of the economy uh, and really ran quite a regime of terror where it could fire people if you spoke out against the dictatorship. Uh, and when Rodney goes back to Guyana, you know, he finds a working class that, that, that is, he finds a Guyana that is very different from the anti-colonial struggle that he knew in the 1950s. He finds a working class that is again divided along racial lines. Uh, um, because the leading dictatorship is playing one group against the other. And uh, Rodney's writings and speeches at the time tried to understand the history of the racial divide within the working class in Guyana, and also explain how these racial divisions can, can be overcome. And what Rodney does in his writings and speeches at the time is that he offers really a materialist explanation for the existence of racism in Guyanese society, but also for the existence of racism under, under capitalism. And how does he understand racism? Well, in his speech, he says that, you know, the racism that we know today, you know, is not a matter of prejudice. Uh, the racism that we know today is a product of the system that we call capitalism, you know. It's first the ideology of the European bourgeoisie, of the planters, of the merchants, to justify the enslavements of Black. And he says that racism survives slavery because capitalist exploitation, if you want, creates the conditions for the maintenance of racism. Uh, and that the ruling classes, you know, in the Caribbean, the planter class realize pretty on that they can use racism to manipulate and divide the working class. So in Rodney's key writing, his history of the Guyanese working people, he explains that, you know, after, after slavery, the black people won their, won their freedom. Uh, in 1838. And after emancipation, what happened is that they became wage laborers on the plantation. And as wage laborers uh, for, higher, for higher wages, and they often won those higher wages. And what he says is that the ruling class, the planter class at the time realized pretty early on that they can use a cheaper source of labor from India, indentured workers, in order to undercut wages and break the back of this growing black militancy on the plantation. And so if you want here, you know, um, racism was used to intensify the competition between black and Indian workers for jobs over the colony and to keep the wages as low as possible. You know, and this, um, uh, and this racism of manipulation, if you like, continues throughout Guyanese history, even when the ruling classes in Guyana um, are non-white after independence, you know, after independence, the ruling classes are, uh, are, are black and they still have an interest in playing this divide and rule between the blacks and Indians, like getting, um, getting um, um, the dictatorship uses Afro-Guyanese um, to, to, uh, as scabs when the Indians go on strike or escapes goes Indians when it comes to like recruiting jobs. And you get this animosity growing between the both communities because you know it fundamentally serves a class interest of those who are in power. You know, it, it's what enables them, it what is what enables the dictatorship to maintain itself in power. And in terms of like how to fight racism, what's really important in Rodney's writings here. Is that, they that, is that he underlines the centrality of the class struggle for fighting racism. You know, he says that it's by fighting the, the ruling class in the streets and in the workplaces that it opens the possibility for the two groups of workers to come together and realize their, their common interests uh, in, in, fighting, in, in fighting against the dictatorship and in that process to overcome their racial prejudices. Um, uh, and what, Rodney is alluding to here is several moments in Guyanese history, like a strike in 1905 or, 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 or the, um, the recent anti-colonial struggle in the 1950s, where um, Black and Indian workers have, have managed to unite in the struggle and overcome their divisions, uh, you know, and strengthen their unity uh, against, against, uh, against capital. Uh, and but Rodney goes on to say something quite interesting. And here we come to the final lesson of his life, uh, which is building the party. Uh, 
Rodney comes to say that, you know, those spontaneous moments of unity between the Guyanese workers are, are great throughout history, but they break down quite easily as soon as the repression actually sets in. And what Rodney says is that, you know, what you need is in many ways, an organization that can help transform that sporadic unity into a permanent undoable link between the working classes. And in Rodney's practice in Guyana, that actually translates into, into building a, a mass you know, revolutionary organization called the Working People Alliance, which starts out first as a pressure group, but increasingly as the struggle picks up, becomes a political party. And Rodney emphasizes on building this mass organization that can carry out an anti-racist argument among the working classes, but also put forward a case against the dictatorship in Guyana and for a genuine kind of socialism from below. And Rodney's organization, the Working People Alliance, does great things. I mean, they end up leading quite a sizable rebellion in the year 1969, where there's a series of, of, of protests and, and a strike by, by the, the, books, the bauxite workers, which are mainly Afro-Guyanese and which are like the supporting base of the, the, of the, the, the dictatorship. And there's a strike within this group. Yeah. And um, Rodney's organization really strives in this um, um, environment, you know, they become the organization that people listen to. Um, uh, they manage to get Indian workers to donate to support African workers on strike. You know, the mass rallies that they hold, you know, often turn into like spontaneous protests. Um, their foundation rally when they become a political party is said that they had like 8,000 people at it. And, you know, this was a tremendous time. But at the same time, they were very much aware that the government was out to get them. And unfortunately, um, the government wins, you know, because by September 1979, there's less strikes and mass protests in Guyana. And uh, what is called the, the civil rebellion was eventually beaten back by the government. And, um, and, and once the mass movement is gone, Rodney and his, and his comrades, and especially the leadership of his party, could no longer be protected by the masses. And they knew that the government was out to kill them. Um, and they were trying to organize their self-defense in many kinds of ways, you know, such as like getting, getting uh, weapons and, and all kinds of equipment. And um, if we come to Rodney's death, you know, on the 13th of June, 1980, um, on that day, Rodney and his brother um, went to buy a walkie-talkie from an ex-soldier who was um, working for the dictatorship. Um, uh, and... Um, when he buys that walkie-talkie and activates it in his car, well, the device like goes up in his face and it kills him, you know, instantly. And luckily enough, his brother survives uh, to be able to tell the tale. But, um, you know, what I can show you here, this image here, which is um, the end of my book, which is the last image of my book, is an image of Walter Rodney's fu funeral which really testifies to his tremendous legacy in Guyana, because here you have, you know, Guyanese people from um, all races, all genders, all ages, all walks of life coming out, um, you know, to, to support the last leader. And Rodney's funeral is the biggest that ever was in, in Guyana, and also one of the biggest protests, because about like 35,000 people attended the funeral. And I think the really like the Guyanese working people really um, recognize that they lost one of their, their greatest and, um, uh, and brightest leaders. And I think it's our duty as revolutionaries today, as socialist revolutionaries, to make sure that Walter Rodney's legacy lives on. Um, that's all I have to say, comrades. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Chen. That was so great. Um, I think when I... Um, read Rodney, what struck me, which I think like the US and the West does such a good job of is um, not really understanding um, what happened when so many black people were kidnapped from Africa, um, the labor and the, and the intelligence that was left with it. I think sometimes when we talk about it here, they're just like people and they left great, but how much of an influence and detriment that was to Africa. So. That always strikes me when reading his work, but that was a great presentation. We're gonna move into um, move into debate and discussion. Um, so the way we're gonna do it is through Slack, is through Stack. 
Um, so if you want to speak, you'll put your name in the chat and I'll write you down and you'll have three minutes um, to speak. Um, and at 30 sec and it, if you have, when you have 30 seconds left, I'll let you know um, that you need to start wrapping up. Um, and then we should get enough people to speak um, and hopefully we can have really good discussion. So I might move it down to two minutes, but we'll start with three minutes. And I'd like to do progressive stack. So um, black, brown, native folks, I'll, um, I'll try and um, center you and get you to speak first um, to generate. Right, I'm just gonna get a pen. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, but yeah, please let's open stack and let's get started. Um, Donna, you wanna go? Sure. I just wanted to say thank you for such a brilliant talk. I really enjoyed it. It was nice to get a lot of the history of Rodney. You know, I read his books when I was 18. I had a history teacher who was Jamaican from the University of the West Indies, whose father had been part of the non-alignment movement. I just really have a question. And that is, you know, I think we've lived through many of us different iterations of the left. And Right now, a lot of us are thinking about racial capitalism and the ways that it fits into the current movements inside the United States and elsewhere. And I would, wanted to hear how you think about Walter Rodney in relationship to this, this more recent lens of racial capitalism. When I first read Rodney, it was in the 1980s, and I saw him very much, I uh, was taught him in the context of that generation of decolonial intellectuals. Walter Rodney, um, Eric Williams, CLR James, um, who, were, who were in some cases still alive. And so, you know, this is also pre-1989. So it was in that tradition, especially of Caribbean Marxism and battles and debates inside the Caribbean and kind of the long tail of anti-colonial movements. And he was really my introduction to thinking about the political economy of race and precisely the point that Kirsten mentioned about the effect that European slavery had on depopulating the African continent and all of its economic consequences. So it was really inverting a lot of the discourses that were being used at the time of overpopulation and you know, the, the arguments about the ways that slavery brought forms of development to the African continent. So I saw him most of all, I think, through the lens of anti-imperialism. And of course, these two things are overlapping, but I was curious about how you would talk about Rodney today, how we might insert him into our contemporary accounts of racial capitalism and kind of the Ro Rodney's legacy. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Um, up next, we've got Phil. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, um, Chinedo. That was a great talk. Um, I, I read, uh, well, I read um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa a long time ago in the 1980s. And that's all I knew about Walter <laughs> Rodney. I didn't know anything about his political organizing in Jamaica or in, in Guyana um, until pretty recently. And I've, you know, I've read some of the stuff you've written. I've read uh, Leo Zelig's uh, book, uh, which are great introductions to um, not just his uh, academic work, but his, um, but most importantly, his political organizing. And I wonder if you can say more about the Working People's Alliance in Guyana, what kind of activity they were involved in, how, um, you know, how big they got to, uh, you said there were 8,000 at the, at the um, funeral march for uh, for Rodney, but um, how many how many people were involved with that? Um, and uh, you said that they, you know, they were def they were um, destroyed by the government. I assume that was sort of outright repression that was used, uh, the police, the the army, etc. Um, but could you say more about that as well? How they were. Um, undermined, and was there any, you know, any any lessons for us to learn from both their um, successful organizing and their uh, eventual defeat? Thanks, so. Um And Chin, at any time, if you want to get on stack to answer some questions, um, that's totally okay too. I don't think we just have to wait for the end. Um, so just let me know. Um, oh, Helena, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Helena, do you want to go? 
Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Tanidu, for the great presentation. Um, so as you were saying in um, in how how Europe underdeveloped Africa, Rodney explains that you know colonialism, neocolonialism, systematically exploited and oppressed uh, the African continent. And I was wondering if you could say a bit about how you view um, Karl Marx's legacy, because I mean a bunch of times you know we Marxists are confronted with hey you know in the 1850s Marx wrote about colonialism in India and he said that uh, uh, you know colonialism how brutal British colonialism may be. In the Indian uh, subcontinent, it's progressive in the sense that uh, you know it, it furthers capitalist development. And I, I mean, there's much research you know that's been done that says, hey, you know, Marx revised his his opinions on that. But I was wondering if you could say a bit about um, how how you view this dilemma that Marxists are often confronted with. Thank you. Um, up next, we've got Lee, and then Stack is open. Hey comrades, hi Chin, it's great to see you. Uh, welcome and uh, really awesome, really great talk. Um, I have kind of two questions that are related. One is just kind of um, kind of leaping off of where the question Phil asked about the WPA. And this may be a little bit of a throwaway, but I'm curious to hear your perspective on this. Uh, it's just thinking about Sailor James's speech at um, Rodney's funeral and his grief, but also and but also a kind of grappling with or frustration with the question of building a party and that where the WPA might have fallen short or didn't quite grapple with the question of the seizure of power and. What, I'm just kind of curious if you, you know, to kind of wrap that into your comments on the WPA and whether um, CLR James was probably, you know, wh whether he was um, off base and so on and, and how that, whether that question was sort of on the table in real time in 1980 about the possibility of building independent workers power. And then I guess related to that, um, and I love your discussion about um, how Europe Underdeveloped Africa, such a great book. But I, I also, um, the, the new release of his book, of Rodney's book on um, the Russian Revolution was very interesting to me. And I just was wondering also if you had, um, what your thoughts are uh, about that. And because, I mean, Rodney has a very interesting relationship to both the non-aligned movement and um, also, and I, I think one that evolved over time, about his relationship to, um, you know, what he perceived as uh, socialism in the USSR and all of its contradictions, and um, you know, and the relationship of um, the USSR to movements in the global south. So, you know, which are also about the question of independent workers' struggle. So, anyway, those are kind of two big, somewhat related questions. And thanks again. Yeah, um, thank you for those questions. Um, can I can I jump in here just to give a, a bit more con context because um, the speech that by CLR James that Lee is referring to is um, is uh, I think a, a eulogy that CLR James del delivered um, on Walter after Walter Rodney's assassination um, in London, uh, which is a very um, you know an emotional text, but at the same time. Um, a um, at the same time, it's a strong, sober political analysis of the failures of of um, of CLR uh, of Walter Rodney of Walter Rodney and his and his party uh, in Guyana. And CLR James raises yeah. raises you know a a lot of points. Like um, on the one hand, he calls <laughs> he um, he's almost on the verge of calling Rodney like uh, an adventurist of. Um, uh, of seizing, of, of trying to seize, uh, of trying to seize power before, uh, uh, before time, of of not being, of not having studied questions of of insurrection, uh, in that of not understanding like the wave of the mass movement. On the other hand, he's also like accusing, accusing the WPA of failing to to protect of Rodney, which is which is also an emotional critique um, on it. Um, I. 
you know, it's a really complicated one. I, I think CLR James analysis should be, uh, should be taken seriously, uh, seriously, even though there's lots of um, factual stuff about the struggle in Guyana that he got wrong, especially because he wasn't in Guyana at the time and was following it from very um, much afar. Also, on some things, I need to take CLR James with, with like a pinch of salt because CLR James is at the time is very much, you know, against the revolutionary party. His emphasis is on like this very much on the spontaneity of the masses on building like um, uh, a mass party and saying that, you know, the, in, in revolutionary situations that the party is absolutely useless. And it's kind of like his own kind of remake of, of Leninism that, that I want to look into to answer those questions. So maybe that's a short way of saying that, you know, I, I don't have um, a clear like answer or rebuttal to like CLR James text, but I do think what I will say is that is an interesting one that has to be taken um, seriously. In terms of like the WPA and the numbers, well, the WPA started out first as a, as a, as a pressure group, right? And it was a is a it was a pressure group with um, um, composed of like you know dozens of dozens of people, um, and, and they 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 had a they had a newspaper and at the at, at 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 the first point what they wanted to do was agitate you know they carried a strong like agitation of work um, among among the working classes especially among the um, uh, the, the the bauxite miners. Um, which were like the most powerful working class group, but also among the, the sugar the sugar workers. Um, and, and you have Rodney here, like, you know, tried to build like branches within that group, also building like different, like um, different, um, also building different like study groups where he's talking to, to, to the workers about like, you know, the political situation in Guyana, the um, uh, giving them lessons on like Marxist political economy, et cetera. But what I really like about this early WPA at the time is that, is that what's quite interesting is that they don't have a sectarian approach to, to politics. They're, they're not like this group that thinks that they're isolated and that has the truth and that people will eventually join them. What they try to do when they're putting a case against the dictatorship is really try to, to broaden out, you know, and work with other people. And I think they get the mixture, the mixture like right at some point. At some point, you know, they manage to build like um, a kind of like, um, united front if you like with different like progressive groups including like the main opposition in uh, in guyana and and different like religious organizations to um to oppose um to oppose a, a referendum by the dictatorship to increase more powers to 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 for up Spurnham. and you know they they they're involved in that kind of thinking which i think is like is like really important what i do think about the wpa is sometimes they bend the stick you know, a bit too far, where instead of like proposing a united front where we're working with groups mainly on the left or or, or centrist groups over a, p a key political issue, um, they propose like a popular front where where this time where this time what they're saying is that they're proposing a government of uni uh, of, um, of of national unity, which is a long term alliance, which would include not just the opposition parties, but also like the, the you know, the, the, the bourgeois elements in society, which I think like it, it's very, is very dangerous because if you look at the history of those kind of like um, uh, big like popular front governments as we saw in Europe in the 19, 19, in the 1930s, you know, when revolutionaries are involved in them, what they end up doing is like compromising and, and stopping the workers from going on strike and carrying out their own uh, liberation in order to preserve unity. So I think like, you know, there's interesting lessons to learn from how the WPA tried to work with other people, both positive and also negative. And when the WPA became a political party, I think was a correct decision to make at the time. The idea that we need a party that is geared for like the seizure, the, 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 the seizure of power that is gonna recruit and train the most important activists, you know, send them across the country to build different cells and different branches. I think that's, that's an important lesson for any single revolutionary struggle. And the, the problem is I think um, the WPA for one was too small uh, in many ways, because it had just been created and too inexperienced to influence like the rising struggle in Guyana, which was, by the way, never like a revolutionary situation or or anything like that. But but what I think 
where the WPA probably also overplayed his hand in the struggling Diana is that they were doing quite a lot of risky stuff at the time. I think they were trying to, you know, build links within within the army, um, uh, possibly thinking that the army um, was uh, elements in the army would be more favorable to them next time the struggle would would uh, would rise to the fore. I think that might have been quite dangerous. Um, I'm still thinking about these these questions within the context of my PhD, and at the moment, don't have a definitive answer. But yeah, they are they are important lessons to learn from the WPA struggles. Um, I think I will leave it. Uh, I'll leave in for some more questions and come back to the first ones later on. If that's all right. Thank you. Stacks open, um, but if it's okay, I'll read out loud Jesse's comment. Um, I was wondering and wanted to know more of how different Marxists influence Rodney's thoughts, or in other words, what is the best classification of Rodney's Marxist ideology, and how did he expand upon some Marxist concepts, much like how Huey P. Newton expanded um, intercommunalism. Um, and then, Aaron, go ahead. Thanks, comrades. Apologies for the my bad lighting here. Um, and thank you, Chin, for that, for, for the talk and for the conversation. It's been um, uh, very interesting. I, I wanted to follow up on something you said, which I, I don't have any um, particular knowledge of, but I'm interested in this question of his experience in Tanzania, um, which I know, you know, <laughs> was very much a kind of lodestone for for sections of the revolutionary left in the early 1970s. And your argument that sort of Rodney, in that experience, sort of started to develop a kind of, I don't even, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I understood you to be saying was sort of developing a nascent sort of critique of a kind of socialism from above. Um, and I wonder to what extent um, that's, that was explicitly theorized, to what extent there's a kind of um, debate and conversation ongoing um, at the moment in the milieu, um, uh, whether specifically around the, the, the uh, Tanzanian experience or, um, you know, more generally, uh, I mean, it's such a moment in, in, the, in, the, in the African struggle of sort of the dominance of um, kind of Stalinist politics and the kind of role in particular of, of, of the Soviet Union and, and the kind of in the African uh, colonial and post-colonial experience. Um, so I'm very interested in, in, in that moment um, and to what extent, uh, you can what we can generalize from that a kind of uh, a broader milieu. Thanks, Aaron. Um, stacks open, y'all. Um, if if um if there's no other comments, I'm going to come back on some of the questions again that I was asked about the beginning. I yeah. think I was asked one about um about racial capitalism, which I find quite interesting because um, because especially I, I just read, I mean, racial capitalism, I just read that Cedric Robinson's book, um, Black Marxism, um, again. And, and what I'm gonna say here is that, you know, in one, on the one hand, I like the term racial capitalism, especially because, uh, and, and that it's coming back to the fore because especially it's shifting the conversation on racism. Where, where if you remember, like for a very long time, it was this privileged theory days where everything was about check your privilege and uh, and you, and you know the struggle against uh, uh, racism was just an individual uh, phenomenon and no paying attention to like the uh, the wider like systemic and structural issues again. Um, here with the concept of racial capitalism, at least you have some kind of improvement where where there's this widespread acknowledgement that you know. Um, the emergence of um, where capitalism um, and race are are phenomenons that are like um, um, that are like interlinked, you know. And I think that is very much uh, a step forward. Especially, it's quite interesting when I was having conversations during the Black Lives Matter protests with people in twenty in twenty twenty. You know, they were a big fan of like Cedric Robinson and this question of like racial capitalism. Uh, when people use the term racial capitalism nowadays, I figure they don't always quote Cedric Robinson, but they think it's just a, you know, a general way of, uh, of acknowledging that, you know, um, uh, that, that the two and two go together. The problem with that 
is that we do have to come back to, to the problems with Cedric Robinson's term racial capitalism, because where Robinson and Rodney would disagree is, um, is, is on the point of where racism comes from. You know, for Cedric Robinson, he locates the origins of racism um, in, um, in feudalism. And he makes the argument that racism is basically transhistorical. And the implications of that, that argument is that basically if you defeat capitalism, well, you've only done one part of the job because uh, then you still have racism to deal with. And that leaves the door open, comrades, for a set of dangerous arguments, arguing that, you know, like what is needed is actually an independent autonomous uh, black movement that can tackle um, the problem of racism on the side. Um, uh, I think, I think really um, Robinson's theory of racial capitalism and, um, and black radicalism is actually kind of a, re a rebirth of a very, uh, uh, of a very academic form of like black nationalism per se. And I think it's, it's one that in many ways Rodney disagree with because, you know, Rodney in one of his speeches, I think on Guyanese politics, which is quite interesting, he picks a bone with those who, who tried to locate the existence of racism in a very different um, epoch. And he locates the existence of racism, um, you know, from the slave trade, where racism um, goes beyond becoming simply a matter of individual prejudice, but really where it becomes a real, like, institutionalized structural re relationship. And I think, and I think this is very important for our understanding of racism today. That racism is a product of capitalist system, and and racism survive, um, racism survives within capitalism because you know uh, it's it 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 embeds itself within the logical within the logic of capitalists that the ruling class you know needs to rely on these divisions between black and white workers in order to to accumulate and not to be challenged so that these black and white workers don't join unions and organizations to fight for their own interests and for the world that they have to gain and this is why rodney's analysis of understanding of the relationship between race and class in Guyana um, that I just talked about in my speech is really, is, is really important. And I think that legacy, Rodney's writings in Guyana, the fact that, that you know, these racial divisions between two sets of workers can be overcome through the, through the class struggle and through building a permanent organization are things that can be generalized to every single context, uh, every single context that we actually live in. Um, thanks, Chen. Um, I wanted to point out some other questions that I think I missed. Um, Don, I don't know if this got answered, but I'll read it out loud too, just to make sure Chen saw it. Um, there were forces inside the US who supported Forbes Burnham um, through the lens of black power. Any thoughts about that, how this concept was appropriated and used in reactionary terms by Marvin X and others? Um, and then somebody said, did Rodney have any ties with George Lamming? Um, and then up next, we've got Andy on stack. Go ahead, Andy. Hi, um, first of all, thank you. It's been a, a really excellent talk and um, learned a lot. Um, originally, when we started um, through Tempest, like considering the experience of Walter Rodney and the WPA, um, it was through the, the question of organization and organization building um and trying to see what can we learn from a model like the wpa um and i think what kind of what we found in in trying to answer some of that question was that it seems like uh, the discussion about what the organization was and its self-conception um was uh, a little bit harder to find than maybe we expected and i was wondering if you could comment on what um you know it, it from from the discussion you gave it sounded a little bit like beginnings of a, a pressure group that sort of trans uh, transformed itself into a different kind of organization. Um, so I wonder if you can talk about what is the, the kind of self-conception of organization through the WPA and uh, any of its internal life and, um, you know, to, in your opinion, uh, what, what holds as a lesson for revolutionaries and what are things that, uh, you know, are, are so are things to be critical of in that experience? Yeah. Um, just to give my to give my opinion on 
on that question. I think the decision for the WPA to to transform themselves into into like a revolutionary party, where which would organize uh, in the streets and the workplaces. Uh, in 1979 was an absolute correct one. And I think it's one to some extent that should be followed. Um, but as you can see, um, with the evolution of the WP, there was always an important tension within it, um, where it, it, it wasn't, you know, there, there were some elements within the WPA that were more akin to like, you know, the, the becoming part of, of the mass movement and less akin to party building. Uh, and there was that, dual tension within it, even on the question of elections, you know, I think a lot of the leadership like Rodney in the WPA wanted to use like elections more as like um, a tactic, but some some eventually over time, especially like saw it more as a um, getting elections as a as an end in itself. And the WPA right now is uh, is much more of a <laughs> is clearly entirely like a, a reformist party rather than a, a revolutionary one that it was in the late 1970s. Also in terms of like the um, internal democracy of the WPA, what's quite interesting is, um, is um, the democratic centralism, you know, the, the never really like took hold very much within this party. And for those, you know, what I mean by democratic centralism in the sense that that different organ that you know, different groups can have like debates within each other during a period of time. And then these debates get sorted by a vote. And then, you know, the ma majority is implemented with carrying out that decision. That, that kind of process never took, never took place. And the problem is, is that on some instances, what I do fear when I look at the WK's experience is that, you know, you have one section of the leadership that decides to, to, um, to I don't know, um, you know, set up this cell where we're going to work on these questions and another section of uh, of the WPA that sets up a group that's going to work on those questions and everything gets done like in kind of like this, this kind of like messy and non-accountable way in some instances. And I think that's part of the problem uh, with the whole question of the WPA accumulating um, weapons, you know, I'm quite surprised to find out that that some a lot of the leaders or a lot of like the ranking, the important members within the party who should be knowing this stuff weren't aware that that um, I don't know Rodney was like smuggled off to, to Zimbabwe uh, uh, to build links with revolutionaries over there in 1980s, you know. So there's 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 those kind of like questions that raise a lot of red flags on how the WPA operated. And when I'm saying that we should learn lessons from the WPA, yeah, they, <laughs> they, they are a few, there are a few negative ones, but it, it is worth thinking step by step through that experience, you know, to find out what, what can be useful for us uh, as revolutionaries today and what we can leave in the dustbin of history. Thanks, Jen. We've got a, another question from Larry. Um, can you say more about um, who has attempted to transpose Rodney to cross-race class-based solidarity when you're dealing with more numerous plurality, um, pluralities of workers defined as white? Are there any others attempting to do this in interesting ways and in what context? And if possible, I'd like to put myself on stack. Um, I've really been interested in in learning about Rodney and reading more about what he means by guerrilla intellectual and how he saw um, the black ac academic, which I think is interesting, especially um, thinking about the movement and what academics have on the movement, like Black Lives Matter and, and police violence right now. Um, a comrade of mine, Devin Springer, came out and gave a speech in Tucson for like the LGBTQ um, convocation and they based it on the guerrilla um, intellectual. I know Rodney says things like, um, in groundings that, um, you know, that that the black academic or an academic in general has to, um, you, you have to show who you really are and you have to organize and you're an enemy until you're organizing. So just thinking about that, because I, I know a lot of us are in academia and thinking about what the academic has to do um, when it comes to like on the ground movement building. Um, so I think that's really interesting um, in his work. And I think he also says stuff like it's it's the duty of people in academia to redistribute any inf information, knowledge and resource um, that comes from the institution and the university. Um, and I know my favorite thing, my favorite story about 
Rodney is, um, you talked a little bit about it, Chen, is, um, is that he refused to like live in the houses that were provided for the professors and he went out and lived in the city um, with, with other workers. So, so yeah, just thinking through what that means um, in being on a college campus um, and being an academic and what Rodney says about that, prove yourself and you have to organize to be taken seriously and you're an enemy until you, until you, until you do that. So, um, but just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Also stack is open if, if anybody wants to get on. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, so Chin, uh, thank you again for all your contributions here. I know that, uh, so you're um, an editor of the Review of African Political Economy, you're a socialist and you're, you're active in the anti-racist Black Lives Matter struggle. Um, and you, you mentioned um, at the beginning, there's been a re um, kind of a upsurge in interest in Walter Rodney um, because of the Black Lives Matter struggle um, in the last couple of years. I'm wondering, um, you've been making kind of interventions and talking about Walter Rodney for some time now. Um, what um, kind of what has been your lens toward um, the anti-racist struggle uh, what's been the reception? Um, what are the things that you're trying to um, uh, educate around or influence with bringing Walter Rodney into that struggle with your work? Um, has it been successful? To what extent? Uh, just kind of, I don't know much about the context in England, um, but I just kind of had, um, I wonder if you had any general uh, thoughts and reflections on that. Thanks, Paul. Stack is open, comrades. Um, I can come up back on some of the um, I got lost in some of my notes. Okay, somebody, I can't remember who asked a question on Rodney's writings on the Russian Revolution, which um, I'm happy to uh, to come back to on that because yeah, no, I do think, I do think they're fascinating, um, uh, those writings. But on the one hand, you know, we have to put things in mind. We, 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 um, we Rodney wrote them in Tanzania in 1971 when he was still a supporter of this like state-driven socialism in Tanzania. Um, his writing of, on the Russian Revolution are like lecture notes where he's trying to use the experience, you know, of Russia, um, um, you know, to make sense about you know what's going on in in Tanzania at the time, you know, to draw radical lessons and struggle from the Russian experience into Tanzania. Um, and to be honest, it's a, it's a mixed bag on that. On the one hand, I think that, um, that um, Rodney says a lot of um, amazing things where, you know, he, uh, he, he recognizes the, the centrality of the working class in the Russian Re revolution and how they built alliances, um, um, uh, with the peasantry and, you know, makes a marvelous statements on, on Trotsky's um, history of the Russian Revolution, which he describes as a monumental piece of work. Uh, 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 and, and all kinds of great things. And you see him going into like, you know, some of like the polemics uh, between like Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg on the question of, 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 um, of, uh, of you know, the um, self-determination um, of, of different peoples. Um, and, and often like signing, siding clearly with, with like Lenin on, on these debates, which is quite interesting. But on the other hand, you know, there's the all, the, the, the problematic aspects of, of it for me, also like the, the, the many, um, the many concessions to, to Stalinism that he makes, you know, for instance, he doesn't necessarily see a clear break between, between Lenin and Stalin in that, in that group where, well, I don't know, in, 
in, in the socialism that I was born in, Stalin's declaration of socialism in one country is the biggest, is, the, is like signed the death of the international socialist movement at the, at the time, you, you know. Rodney sees that more as a, as a, as a bad, like, as a bad policy uh, or as a policy that suited the, the necessity of the times because there was like um, uh, an ebb of all the struggles going on in Europe. So I think there's, there's a lot where I would disagree on on Rodney on that, or even when he talks about the, the whole question of like how collectivization was was carried out on the Stalin, he is critical of Stalinism, but he but the criticisms you have the impression that they're they're, they're not one that is always consistently ad addressed to like the Stalinist regime as a whole, but more into like how the process of colonization um, collectivization was 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 carried out in itself. So I think, you know, when we're reading Rodney's writings on the Russian Revolution, um, we have to take it, you know, as a pinch of salt, as one that's trying to, to, to defend that, like, you know, top-down approach of, like, Tanzanian socialism at the time. And I think that Rodney, towards the end of his life, you know, with all the great criticisms um, that he developed against Tanzanian socialism, would have written that book in a completely different manner, I, I reckon. And, and on and on his um and, and on his you know evolution from from um, socialism from above to socialism from below, which is an incomplete one. Like he writes important, like it's, it's interesting reading like some of the um the, the speeches or articles that he writes at the time. I mean, there's one that I I would re refer to the person who asked me a question on Tanzania called like class contradictions in in Tanzanian. Um, society, which uh, which which basically is when he starts to talk about this the resistance of the workers, you know, around uh, around um, around uh, around the nationalized factories in Dar es Salaam, and he talks, you know, with like such passion about a, a rubber factory that was occupied by these by these workers and where they kicked out the management in it, and it's and it's quite extraordinary. And Leo Zilli's book really um you know, um, goes deep into that aspect when Rodney goes to Hamburg in 1978. There too, he makes important reflections on, on, um, on the Tanzanian socialism, where he says that, you know, this is not real socialism. This is socialism of the petty, of the petty bourgeoisie and the party that's in power in Tanzania won't be able to carry out the socialist development. And he's absolutely right, because like in the 1980s, they, they all caved in to like the demands of the IMS and to, to neoliberalism and austerity uh, um, in Tanzania. And it's, and it's amazing that kind of insight that he, um, that he, had, at, that he had at the time. Um, on the question of, somebody asked the question of black power, which I thought was really, um, was really interesting because it's true. Rodney goes back to Guyana in, in the 19, in the 1970s, and um, at the time, the well, the, the Guyanese dictatorship calls itself socialist. Uh, it's a very opportunist dictatorship because in the 1950s, it was it was really um it, it got to power thanks to the C CIA. But in the 1970s, it called itself socialist. Um, it wasn't. It also said that it was favorable to black power, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, and Guyana becomes this place that that actually hosts like all these different kinds of like. Uh, African black power like sex or, or, or religious organi organizations, you know, and um, one of them is the, um, is I think is known as like that the House of Israel, which becomes this like re repressive like gang which the government uses to beat on like supporters of the WPA or anybody protesting against the dictatorship at the time. And this explains in, in many ways, in, in very pragmatic ways, why Rodney has to like drop all, all this talk about about black power at the time, you know, why he has to make a, a leap from black power to like revolutionary socialism, because like, you know, the, the state is instrumentalizing black power in order to increase the divisions between, you know, the, the, uh, the Afro-Guyanese uh, and the indo guyanese So like talking about black power in Guyana is completely, <laughs> is completely out of the question at that time. Yeah, thank you. Stacks, I, yeah, Stacks open, um, but there's two questions in here. Um, Helena says, I don't think it has been answered yet. So if it's okay, I'll just type my question here again regarding how colonialism factually underdeveloped Africa and the global South. 
Could you maybe say something about your thoughts on Marx's writings on British colonialism and colonized India in the 1850s that he said um, that although British colonialism was brutal, he argued that it is a necessary evil for the development of capitalism. There has been- Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll come back to that. I mean, like, again, again, um, you, you know, you um, we have to be careful about not reading Karl Marx through the lens of like the likes of like Edward Said and, and you know, the, the post-modernist, post-colonial thinkers like that, who uh, looked at Marx's, uh, looked at Marx's early writings in India and drew conclusions that, that Marx is, was racist and part of the imperial project. Uh, Marx does say stupid stuff at the beginning of his writings, as you just said in, in the question. But what's quite interesting is that his whole analysis of, of, of India changes as he, as, he go on, as he goes on through time, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not the one that's, that's what the most well versed to talk about that but i think there's a great book by i can't remember who called marx in india where where basically i think marx ends up drawing the the, the conclusions that you know capitalism in india like fails to bring actual like development in india at the time and becomes like an avid supporter of like you know an anti-colonial uh, an anti-colonial like revolution in india and one that would also help free um, um the british working class in their struggle uh, and also, like somebody asked a question on um, on, on who else is doing this analysis between um, uh, race and class, which is quite similar uh, to the materialist explanation of racism that Rodney answers um, that Rodney offers in the case of Guyana. And I think what was quite striking to me is that um, that they they ring quite similar to to Marx's writings on the Irish question that he developed on the on the nineteenth century. And somebody asked the question on the shade of of white. Well, in the UK um, at that time, the Irish people the Irish people were not were not white. They were like a, a colonized group. And and, and, Rod, and and Marx, like Rodney, is seeing how 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 you know with the the mass migration of Irish workers in the 19th century that you have this ruling class that is like playing the two groups against each other so that the Irish worker sees the Indian uh, the Irish worker sees the English worker as the slave of the crown etc uh, and while the um the the English worker sees the Irish worker as the competitor who's trying to steal their their jobs and this and this if you want racist division is kept fully alive by 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 the instruments of the ruling class such as the media and the pulpits and etc and it's quite interesting because rodney draws those same conclusions in a totally different context in, in plant when writing about plantation society in guyana where he says that you know through the waste racism of the white planters well both groups hate end up hating each other where you have the um in the in the guyanese workers who see the, the Africans as like lazy, who would have starved if indentorship was never brought into the colony. And then the African workers who think that the, um, the, the Indo-Guyanese workers are slaves of the, of the planters who will work for like, for, like, for like anything. And Rodney says is that it's amazing how like the two groups come to identify or relate to themselves through the white planter stereotype um, uh, at, the, at the time. And the colonial ruling class is fully aware of those divisions and it maintains them. And he quotes a plant that says, you know, I'm in a minority, but I feel safe because I know that if the Negroes attack me, I can use the Indians to defend me. And, you know, it's a fantastic book. I mean, like read um, uh, Rodney's history of the guy and he's working people because it really comes out. I think, I think it's also very similar to um, Du Bois writing on the, the Black Reconstruction in America with those, those, those similar themes. Um, that I just talked about do come out quite strikingly, strikingly when Dubois writes upon the period of the reconstruction. I hope that answers the question. Um, Garrett put a question in the chat, which I'm real, this is a, I'm really interested in this question. What do you think Walter Rodney would have viewed um, a pan-African movement today? How can Africans in the Western world build a pan-African agenda for the 21st century using Walter Rodney as a guide? And I know we wanna, um, it's been nice because Jim's been able to answer questions as we go, but I know we wanted to end um, with him closing the space for maybe five minutes. So. 
Um, if folks want, we can have a couple more people get on staff before we close out with Chen. Can I can I come to the question of the guerrilla intellectual? If nobody yeah, yes, please, yeah. Wants to wants to say anything because um, it's interesting when I heard Rodney use the term guerrilla intellectual. It's once and and it's in a specific context. I think in the um, mid nineteen seventies where he um, where he's traveling from Guyana, I think, um, to go give like a few talks at the Institute of of the Black World. And therefore, he's in Atlanta and speaking in a very American context. Um, uh, and he says, basically, the first thing for the, the I think he's, don't quote me on it, but he says the first step for the Black guerrilla intellectual is to create himself a radical, a radical niche in academia, you know, a space for yourself where you can develop your, your radical work uh, and etc. cetera. Um, my supervisors um, <laughs> at Oxford who, 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 who claim to be radical uh, academics, you know, have have used this question of the uh, guerrilla intellectual uh, to to say like that was the end all of Rodney's of Rodney's like thoughts and 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 how brilliant this concept was. And honestly, like, you know, I don't think it represents one one bit the most crucial lessons that we can draw from Rodney on on the role of the radical intellectual i think would really what's really interesting with rodney is is that is how is how the radical intellectuals leave the academia and embed themselves with like real movements that are engaged in the process of like changing society um, um you, and, and this raises all sorts of questions that i haven't you know thought through what's the relationship between the academic uh between the intellectual in those movements and 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 the masses um what is seen through Rodney's, you know, experience is that he gets very worried when talking about like, you know, different African states or different states in the Caribbean, um, which have won the struggle against colonialism, but he sees this intellectual class that is leading about to conquer state power as having this like, you know, unchecked tendency of rising above the masses and taking and taking like uh, decisions for the masses under the pretext that they know better than the masses in the third world because obviously they're the ones who who are privileged who, who receive that like education um and and you know rodney um at first hand which is quite interesting is he likes a lot this question that this um this notion that Amakar Cabral, the Guinean revolutionary, talks about, which is this notion of like class suicide, saying that that um, intellectuals should really um, cease to renounce their privileges and join in the efforts um, of the masses to to build a new society where the masses will be in power. But the problem is, is that you know, as he analyzes Tanzanian, um, the Tanzanian revolutionary, as he wavers in his support, you know, from socialism, from above to, to below well he realizes this idea of uh slowly that this idea of these like bright intellectuals being able to break break with the, their ranks is like becomes a, a fantasy and i think in many ways that's why in guyana rodney is quite adamant of building you know a movement that is major that 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 is a movement of the working class and the working people with where, where these intellectuals that 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 lead the movement can in certain degree be held to account by the masses uh, in struggle um you know i don't have the final answer on that but those are a few a few like reflections uh, a few thoughts that i have on it nice thank you um we i thought we had a question oh no okay um natalia go ahead yeah, I do have a quick question. I, I think this has been fantastic and I've learned a lot and there's a lot of things I'm excited to go and read or reread. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and I guess my main, my question is just like, what's the reception been to your book? Since it's, I know it came out this spring, like in the context of, you know, a renewed 
radicalization, but also, you know, a black struggle and the struggle against racism. Is there a renewed interest in Walter Rodney in, in the UK? And, and have, has, has there been any response to your book along those lines? And um, I'll, I'll, are people asking some of these organization questions around the book? Um, and then I also just wanted to say, like, I think we want to, Tempest wants to organize a series more, like, around revolutionary figures, revolutionary organization. And if you have an idea for something that you think would make a good um, discussion like this about other topics, I'm going to put an email address for our steering committee in the chat box. You can just email us. Doesn't We can't do every single one, so I can't promise we'll be able to do it, but um, I'm pretty excited about this series, and I want to hear from everyone. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. I think that's, um, we can close stack and then we've got four minutes. So Chen, if you wanna close out um, and then I think we're good to go, yeah. Yeah, um, I close out with some of the reception um, of my book because I mean, Natalia, you, you ask an important question, but what I will say is that my book was published by a small socialist publishing house and um, and even though it was serialized online, I think, I think uh, I would like to do more as many speeches possible to, uh, to get it out there. And I find it quite difficult to actually measure the actual re reception of my book. So if any of you want to like read it, write reviews, you know, get the word going, um, uh, please do so. But also, you know, it's not just the reception of my book. I don't think can only be discussed in by paying attention to like these subjective factors, EI me doing talks. I think there's also an objective context here where, where I don't, well, in the UK and probably in the US as well, there's been a slight like downturn um, of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think, you know, I think in general, uh, if Rodney is going to be read more, it's going to be in direct proportion to the movements that seek to dig him up from the grave, that seek to, to, uh, to see the relevance of his of his ideas and how he speaks to to our time today on many different on, on many different issues, whether it's climate change, um, whether it's um, the anti-racist struggle, with whether it's the question of like understanding imperialism and how to fight it. You know, these 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 subjects will come up to the fore as movements rise and rise. And to give you an example of that. One of Rodney's former comrades in the 1970s, before he went to Guyana um, to fight by Rodney's side, was in was in Portugal, and he was in Portugal in 1974 during like the coronation um, revolution, which was um uh, you know the Portuguese revolution was in many ways like a, a way more advanced process uh, than than May 1968 in France or whatever, where there was real like you know real like Soviets, uh, workers, workers occupation and control of the factories. I mean, a, a fantastic, a fantastic event. Uh, and this event was partly sparked by the, um, by the anti-colonial resistance against Portuguese, the Portuguese empire in the colonies of um, Angola, Mozambique, um, you know, and Guinea-Bissau. And, and what Rodney Connor sees when he's in revolutionary Lisbon at the time, he's, is that in every single bookshop, in every single bookshelf, he can he can find like a Portuguese translation of how Europe underdeveloped Africa at those early stages in history, because you know when when the masses you know are fighting against their own fascists, their own tyrants, well there's a desire for them to challenge any single kind of oppression, to um, to learn to learn about history, you know, to transform themselves in the process of transforming the world. And I think with the Black Lives Matter movement that exploded in 2020, we saw we saw a glimpse of that. Um, and and to answer your your question, um, uh, to answer your question, Paul, like I'm part of um of a revolutionary socialist organization in the UK, which is called the the Socialist Workers Party, which is a, you know, which is a small organization, but we also say like it's an organization that tries to punch above its weight. And why we say that it's not because we're running around all the time. It's because you know we try to devise a, a strategy. Um, to build, to enter, intervene in different campaigns with different groups, and one of our key campaigns in the UK is um, is called is called um, is called Stand Up to Racism, 
where we create this platform where revolutionaries and especially non-revolutionaries, so I'm thinking about reformists and the Labour Party and, uh, and, um, and religious organisations can, can come together over the question of fighting racism in British society. But it also allows us as revolutionaries to carry out revolutionary organisations, uh, revolutionary arguments on how to fight racism um, while being involved in the actual struggle and the poor people closer to our orbit and also to poor people within the ranks of our party. And I think it's been you know, quite effective in intervening during the Black Lives Matter struggle in 2020, where, where you know, we played quite an, an important role of in organizing like protests in the, in the park where people would come and take the knee and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think there is an importance of building like a revolutionary organization as Rodney tried to do in the 1970s in Guyana that can, you know, find ways to work with all the other people to carry out that anti-racist, anti-imperialist argument so that the next time the masses come up, next time the spontaneous actions of the masses of the working class comes to the fore, but we will be in a position to influence the outcome of the struggles so that we win once and for all. That's all I have to say. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you so much. This was so great. Um, thanks to everybody who contributed to the conversation, um, even in the chat. That was amazing. Um, Paul just put um, some links um, to purchase the book. Um, so hope we can do that. Um, yeah, so thanks, comrades. Have an amazing rest of your weekend. Thank you to Chin. Uh, much gratitude. Forward ever, backwards never. So solidarity, y'all. Thanks, Chen. Thanks all. Thanks for sharing, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Chen. It's really good yeah, to be no, here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, comrade. Really much appreciated. It was great. Really great discussion. Cool. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's great to have so many people on the on the meeting. Are you absolutely? We'll get you the we'll make sure that the link gets to you for when it gets uploaded. Oh, yes, please do. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, totally. All right.